Uh, so my name's Kirk. Um, I work at a company called Red Shield, run the OWASP user group. Um, you've probably heard who I am. Um, and uh, the first, the, so I've uh, grabbed bits of different slide decks that I've done. And uh, this is my first slide deck uh, to share with you, and it's about how to build a secure web application. So you start off with this great idea, and you know that there are users, and you've got a cool idea for an application to make like a to-do list for these users, and they can add items to the to-do list. And so uh, you sit down and, and you're com at your computer, and you do some software development life cycling, and you build a to-do list application, and you're like, I'm ready to share this to the world, and I'm going to make millions of dollars. Uh, and so you rent a web server, and you put your application on the web server. And like, I'm going to be rich. But then, well, I guess you have to have a firewall if you're going to put stuff on the internet. And you have to have like a production environment where you're, you know, the stuff that customers use is that's separate from your testing environment. So you put your web server in this special area with a firewall in front of it. And then you're like, well, if I've got a firewall, I need to have a web application firewall to monitor traffic on the way in for PCI reasons and a proxy to make sure that outbound traffic is secure. And you need to use antivirus because PCI says antivirus is good, despite uh, the best efforts of every security professional to convince them otherwise. Um, and you know, now you're secure. I'm like, oh, crap. Well, I also need an intrusion detection system, data loss prevention system so that no data leaves my environment. I need to track the identity. Um, of all the users who can get into my production environment. I need to collect all the logs and push them to a seam so that I can be alerted. Um, and now I'm secure, right? Well, well, no, because what if the software that you're creating was insecure to begin with, right? So then you need to have some security training. I don't know, something like this weekend, maybe. Um, and you need to have someone reviewing code, maybe peer review or maybe a security expert. You could do some threat modeling, which we'll talk about later in the afternoon. Um, you can use uh, static and dynamic uh, analysis tools or even interactive analysis. To, I can't remember what that stands for. Um, and you know, you can do some security testing. You're like, now my code's secure. We're ready to go, right? Well, no. Because like, maybe you need to have runtime application security protection, or you need to make sure you're hard in your operating systems, manage patches in your production environment, um, have some file integrity monitoring to make sure that none of the files in your environment are altered by attackers. Uh, you need to have like a governance function in your organization to make sure that when someone joins your company or leaves your company, that you remove and add them from your identity management system um, and you need to have configuration management so that you can prove that you've hardened your operating systems and that you've managed your patches. Um, if you're running in the cloud, you might want to use cloud workflow protection. It's the new hotness I hear. And you might want to automate your releases so that you have a repeatable build and you know what's going into production. And then, of course, all of these things might break. So you need to have monitoring for all of those things that publish to your seam, and then your seam can monitor itself or something. Uh, and because, you know, uh, none of this is anything unless it's written down and the next person after you does it, you also need to have policies and operating procedures. So now you're secure, right? Uh, and then someone says, well, prove it. And you're like, well, that. And they're like, no, we want someone else to prove it. Or uh, well, you're like, well, uh, we do vulnerability scans to check if we've got any issues. We have some third party come in and do configuration reviews for us. We pay penetration testers. And of course, attackers are attacking us every day anyway. So isn't that the best proof? Um, as far as we know, we haven't been hacked. And so now you're secure. And so, I don't know, maybe this is industry best practice for a to-do app that you want to publish on the internet. Uh, so you've built it securely. Hmm? You're hosting it securely. And you've verified it's secure. Proximate cost? <laughs> oh, and it's, it's like a bit of a barrier, right? Just to publishing a, a little to-do list app. But kind of almost everything on that slide, if you weren't doing it and you had a data breach, someone would say you're negligent. 
uh, the press would say, well, you know, obviously um, the reason that Facebook lost all the users' data is because they didn't have runtime application self-protection uh, running. Uh, and, you know, like it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a thing. But, you know, we're here to learn how to build secure web applications. Um, and sometimes your applications have bugs that none of those tools will know about because they're business logic issues. You know, you just, you didn't think about this use case if, an, if someone goes to a URL that's only administrators are supposed to see, or they press back and then next, and they change the total and then they press back, and then they end up getting their computer for free, um, which my friend did. Um, so, you know, like, these things happen all the time, and so you need to be really good at deploying your code quickly. Uh, and so have that automation because your quickest defense against an attack is going to be uh, releasing a new version of your code as quickly as possible. Cool, so that was part one of this talk. Um, so yes, that's sweet, I'm sure Ian covers all that um, and as, as do all the other courses online. So, uh, so part two of this talk, we're going to look at a little application that I've prepared earlier. Uh, and this is a, a zero days uh, purchase website. Um, so, just because uh, one time someone actually got offended and thought I was trading in zero days, these are just Metasploit module names. And nothing real is happening here. But on this website, you can add things to a shopping cart um, and, you know, go through and pay $12.37 for a free Metasploit module. Um, and when you get to the end, it'll ask for your credit card number. And um, pretty much, I just took every possible vulnerability and put it into this application. So I'll show you two of them. Um, the first is that um, after you sign up and log in, uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, um, that might be a vulnerability. Um, you can add comments about products, you know, like, I don't know, turning your e-commerce site into a social hub or whatever marketers say. This is the best exploit ever. Yeah, I think the bad spelling makes it even more legitimate. Um, and so uh, the first type of issue we're going to look at is what happens if someone types JavaScript into this. And if you were in the CTF, Matt showed a couple of examples of cross-site scripting. Um, and this application just happily accepts JavaScript and then runs it on the page. And so that JavaScript didn't do very much, just displayed the number one but uh, it could do anything that your website can do in the user's browser. Um, so a, another feature of this site is that you can search for things. So if you search for ghost, it'll show you all the things that are for sale in GhostScript. Or if you search for E, it'll show you all the things that are for sale to do with the letter E, which is particularly useful. Um, and the first thing that you do when you see a search box is you, well, I mean, if you have permission from the owner of the site, um, <laughs> you might try searching for O'Malley, which I think is probably defensible, um, and you get an error message, and you're like, well, what's wrong with O'Malley? Uh, what's wrong with O'Malley? Single quote. Yeah, a single quote. And so this is a sign of another issue called SQL injection, which we'll talk about, where the single quote actually has a special significance. So if we go back to searching for ghost, we should only have one result. But if I do a single quote, I can type some other stuff into the SQL query. I think that's the syntax. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Um, and instead of getting one result, I get zero results. <laughs> Ands and ors. Um, and so you can use this to look at other uh, stuff on the site because you're actually putting your own SQL in there. So let's jump back to those slides. Um, hey, well, this gave it away. That was supposed to be a reveal. Um, when, when I was using that site, I was using a proxy called Burp, and that just captures every request from my browser to the web server as it goes through, and it just logs them in here. Um, and so here somewhere you can probably, it's probably a bit small, but somewhere in one of these is my search term, ghost or one equals one dash dash. Um, and this is what 
an HTTP request looks like. It's basically a bunch of text. Um, luckily, you're still of an age where uh, HTTP is plain text. Um, HTTP2 is going to be a bit harder to read, um, and it's kind of rolling out at the moment. Um, so which bits of this HTTP request that my browser sent to the web server would you say are dangerous? Kate, you are a security professional <laughs> with an unprofessional attitude towards <laughs> audience interaction. Um, yeah, so you might think, well, the only unsafe part in here is the word ghost, because that's the bit the users typed into their browser. But actually, everything that came from the browser to my web server is suspicious. So if you're writing a web application, you need to think about, can I trust the URL that the users typed into my browser? Can I trust which browser they say they're using? Like if you're turning a feature on for mobile app, mobile Safari, what happens if someone, I, I don't know. Um, is the referrer what they're saying it is? Are they really from Great Britain? Uh, and are the cookies safe? Are the cookies tampered with? Because um, as you'll see if, if you do CTFs and if you play around with this stuff, you know, you can change any of this. In Burp, um, I can just replay this request um, and change any part of it. So I can change that cookie, stick some gibberish in, um, and run it. Um, didn't work, but you know what I mean. So, so the, the main thesis of this talk is you shouldn't trust anything, and you should have an appropriate level of paranoia in your day-to-day -day interactions as a web developer, um, where that paranoia is totally paranoid. Cool. So I forgot what time I'm supposed to finish. So, uh, so I wrote a book, um, and hands up, uh, and uh, call out if you're not Kate, H have you read one of these books before? Oh, awesome. So, uh, so old people, um, so before the internet and before hypertext, um, people used to chop down trees and roll them out flat and glue them together, <laughs> um, and we called them books. And, uh, and books were boring and linear and not like web pages. Uh, and so people made uh, like pick a path books where you'd flip from page to page to page. And uh, I made this pick a path book talking about cross site scripting, and you can read the whole book later. It's a real doozy. Um, it's not really. Um, so, anyway, uh, so these pick a path books always had a disclaimer to make it sound really scary. Like there's a possibility you might die in the story. Um, unlikely to happen in cross-site scripting unless you're maybe flying on a plane there. I don't know. Um, so, so back in the old days um, of the internet, before many of us were born, um, JavaScript was invented. And I think the story goes something like a guy from Netscape wanted to do something. So he like, worked overnight and made this dynamic language he called Mocha or something like that. And uh, I don't have an exact date for it, but I'm guessing it was somewhere between minutes and hours later, cross-site scripting was invented. Um, and cross-site scripting is a big thing. So as of 2018, um, that pie chart there shows that a, a bunch of different bug bounties, 12.8% um, of the issues found were cross-site scripting. Google's current uh, often held up as an example of a company that's got its shit together, um, but 60% of their bug payouts were cross-site scripting. Um, and so pretty much every website has cross-site scripting. I'm sure that the website you're looking at right now, Google Docs, probably has it somewhere in it. Oh, and I wanted to say another thing. Um, the slides will be available later. Please don't type this URL into your browser. Last time I gave a talk where I showed the Google Docs link, um, when I sat down after my talk, I had a um, will you share your doc with me request. I was like, how did you do this? Um, and they're like, oh, while you were talking, I typed it into the browser. Don't do that. You've got better things to do with your life. We'll share the slides. <laughs> um, cool. So, so what's the basic issue with cross-site scripting? Well, it's because um, HTML was invented in simpler times by simpler people. Um, and they decided, in their wisdom, to shove code and data together. Um, and anytime this happens, badness happens. It's the same issue with SQL injection. 
Um, anytime you stick code that you're executing and you have data that users are entering and you shove them in to the same thing, um, bad stuff happens. Um, so when the web browser is looking at this page um, to display, it's doing nothing, the word hello, it doesn't know whether the web server wants, the web server author who wrote the software wants hello to be displayed, it doesn't know if an attack has put it in there, it doesn't know anything really about it, so the browser just trusts what it receives and displays it. But if your page is displaying the user's name and they enter a script tag, then um, the web server returns a script tag, the browser runs it, it doesn't know that it could be dangerous. So um, I'm not gonna go into all the possible things that a script tag could do, and there's actually a lot of other variations of cross-site scripting, but they all kind of center around this idea that you're trusting user input and just blatting it out onto an HTML page. Um, yeah, you can Google, there's lots of YouTube videos that will do that justice. Um, and there is a way, uh, and the problem is that, you know, even if the user just enters their name, your web page could be displaying the user's name in many different ways. So it could be displaying it inside an HTML tag, it could be in the attribute value of an input tag, could be part of a URL, it could be for some reason your name could be the color in a style sheet, um, or you might be um, putting the name into a JavaScript variable. And unfortunately, every time you output someone's name, uh, you need to make it safe for whichever one of those contexts you're putting it in on your page. And even more unfortunately, the next slide's not the right slide, uh, well, yeah, I want to talk about that. Even more unfortunately, the way you make it safe is different. So if I want to make, um, say my name is Kirk, ampersand, that thing at the top, if I want to make it safe for HTML, I turn the ampersand and uh, less than symbols into ampersand blah, blah. If I want to make it safe in attribute, um, I need to make sure the double quote is safe. If I want to make it safe in a URL, I need to URL encode it and so on for all the different ways that you use um, the person's name. It's a real pain in the butt. Um, the alternate, um, and so we call that encoding when you make something safe. The alternate to encoding input is to just restrict input. So you only let people type in A through Z for their first name. And then you very quickly find that outside of a small portion of European looking New Zealanders, a through Z uh, is not how people write their first names. Um, so it's quite hard to do validation uh, to restrict input, but you know, for some stuff, like if it's only supposed to be a number, you can do restrictions. Cool, so if you wanna um, keep reading, um, there's a video of that, the, the rest of that talk, um, where I talk about content security policy. Um, please go check it out, it's under the 2019 version of the conference that we run, but links will all be given at the end anyway, end of the, end of the two days. Um, here's an example you might have seen from the pseudocode this morning. Um, this was, I think, the second or third um, snippet of bad pseudocode. And now this might look a bit familiar. Um, here it's fetching the comments from the database and just displaying the comment inside an HTML tag without doing anything special. Um, and the way that we figured out to fix it in Secure Code Warrior was to convert it to encoded values using a security-oriented library, um, which uh, is something like this, having a, a function that does HTML encoding or attribute encoding or URL encoding. And the main thing I want you to take away from this sentence is don't write those functions yourself. Um, use the ones that come with your libraries. So that was the first case of don't trust user input, which was cross-site scripting. And uh, SQL injection is really similar. So on that vulnerable website that I prepared earlier, um, there was a parameter on that page called search term, um, which if you put a single quote in, finished an SQL statement and let you start another part of an SQL statement, which would run as code on your database server. Uh, just in case I didn't have internet, I ran SQL map just before. So SQL map is a tool that you point at 
a website or a web page or a parameter. Um, and it will uh, give you a disclaimer telling you the stuff that we've been telling you, that you need to use, only do this on websites you're allowed to. Um, and then it will try and figure out what sort of database server you've got behind it, um, what sort of vulnerabilities there are. So it's testing for different types of vulnerabilities. It's testing if the university Wi-Fi is good, apparently. Um, and then it says, search term is vulnerable. And uh, it kept going. So it found out it was a Boolean blind uh, vulnerability. And then, interestingly, even though the search was only across the products table, it, by adding different SQL statements to the end of that search query, it's figured out the names of all the other tables in my database. Um, and then it's tried to enumerate the columns. So it's found the, col the columns for some of them. And then it started downloading the data um, all through that one parameter of my web page. And so how that ends up is an empty directory, is a directory like this, full of CSV files that contain all the data from my web server um, extracted through that one parameter of that one web page. So when, um, when someone earlier in the last two days, I've forgotten who, said, you know, SQL injection is a big deal, this is why. Because not only is it running untrusted code, it's running untrusted code that then can get data out of your web server. Um, and it's just doing that by changing that URL and then looking at the responses and adding new things to the URL. So, oh, what was this? Oh, this was a video of SQL map running. Yeah, that was pretty exciting. Um, but I guess it just shows you how fast this, this stuff actually runs, um, especially after I sped it up so it runs fast. Um, cool. That was, that was educational, I think. Um, cool. So, um, so SQL injection was the second example. And I just wanted to tie that back to the pseudocode from this morning. So if you got past the first couple of exercises, you would have seen this pseudocode where um, someone's creating a select statement by joining together three strings. So the string with the left-hand part of the SQL query, the actual user's username, and then the right-hand part of the SQL query. Um, and the reason this is an issue um, is that the username can have single quotes in it, um, which means that username equals single quote finishes, and then you can type other stuff, like and, or join, or union or any of the other SQL keywords and write your own SQL on the right-hand end of that statement. Um, so the, the suggested way to fix this type of issue um, is to not concatenate strings together um, because uh, what you're doing there is you've got one string that you've got, that's your result that contains some user input and some code. Um, and as we know, user input and code shouldn't mix. Um, and so most database libraries will have a thing called a prepared statement, and that's where you separate your code from your user input. So the prepared statement's that first line, and you just put placeholders in, and then you add variables to your prepared statement, and at runtime, your database engine knows the difference between the two. Yeah, so uh, to summarize, uh, which part of this HTTP request should we trust? None of it. Cool. Okay. Um, and uh, anything else to say on that? Oh, yeah. Don't trust anything. Which part of life should you trust? No. Anyway, uh, so that's, that's the end of my talk. Um, coming up in five minutes, we'll have our next speaker. Man, the MC is a bit slack. Um, so Anna will be speaking in five minutes. Um, is there any questions for me while she comes up and sits up? Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so the question, the, or the statement was, uh, maybe you shouldn't do it yourself when it comes to security. Um, yes and no. Like, I don't think you should be writing any libraries you should be rewriting any of these kind of fundamental libraries. And I think um, foreshadowing, and maybe I'll ruin Kate's talk, she's probably going to say similar stuff in her talk. 
um, and that maybe that's just paying her back. But, um, but you know, like in terms of security, everyone needs to do security. It's just that we need to build on the shoulders of, you know, giants. So we, we don't want to be inventing solutions to problems that have already been solved. We want to focus on the hard stuff or something. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the slides will be available. Um, I will probably send out an email on Monday or Tuesday to everyone with links to the site and the slides that we've collected, and then we'll dribble, dribble more slides on as we get them from speakers. Cool. Okay, good time to stop. Thank you very much.